Well, welcome for another Saturday. I uh, thought today we would take a look at the souvenir slides from the 64 Fair. It occurred to me just how unique the 64 Fair was in that regard. Uh, it really came out at the, at the time when uh, home photography was just exploding. The Instamatic camera had come out. People were buying, you know, all sorts. Beforehand, it was, of course, you know, you put in the, uh, the roll of film, roll it, roll it, roll it, hope it, it threaded right, take your pictures. But now home photography with the Instamatic just exploded. And the, res the resulting interest in photography, I think, really hit the 64 fair at the right time. If you go back to the earlier fairs, like the 62 Seattle fair, there were a number of souvenir slides that were sold for that. Uh, there was Morley Photographers, uh, Technicolor, Panaview. There were a number of slides, maybe about 100 in total. You get into uh, Expo 67 up in Montreal, there were about 64, maybe 72 souvenir slides. In between was the New York World's Fair with the souvenir slides measured in the hundreds. I mean, we're not gonna take a look at them all today because we'd be missing dinner, but I just thought it'd be <laughs> kind of fun to go through and see what the, uh, the, uh, you know, the mix of them are. Uh, so, let me, uh, before I forget, let me just throw folks on mute here. Let's see, participants, mute all. And again, as ever, if, if you see anything that's going absolutely crazy, throw up your hands. Carol or Don can let me know. We'll go through it. But let me uh, go back to uh, share screen. So we're going to start with the first ones here. Okay, one second. Share screen. And there we go. So the first one here, a very uh, nice uh, invitation to the 64 World's Fair. These are slides from the Bell system. Uh, we'll be going through a number of different vendors. The main vendor for the fair was Photolab. They had the uh, quote exclusive unquote contract for uh, photographic representations of the fair. Turned out a lot of people then sub licensed stuff from uh, uh, Photolab or a few found some loopholes or ways around it. So these are slides that the Bell System made available to Bell System employees and to the other Bell System operating companies trying to explain where all their advertising dollars for the next couple of years were gonna be going and why everybody should participate uh, in New York. So a lot of these were real early, fair hadn't been built yet. So we get concept art of things here like the Astral Fountain. They did throw some real pictures in, uh, the serpentine phone booths, uh, GM in the background. Oh, let me rotate this one around. There's a few of these I had not uh, rotated. This was their initial concept for um, the, uh, uh, what became you know, the, the hands-free the, the family phone booths out there. So the thought was that they would have these scattered around the family booth for hands-free phoning. Picture phone, of course, we knew uh, in the basement of the uh, AT&T building. And uh, folks may remember it. You would go into a lottery, pick a, uh, a number out, and they say, okay, number 211, you get to be in booth one, and uh, 257, you're in booth seven, the operator sat in the center. If it was early in the morning, you got to talk just from booth one to booth seven, but it was later in the day, and Disneyland had opened up and come to uh, uh, work, you could talk to somebody out of Disneyland. Knowing people that worked at the Bell System Pavilion, I had to fix in and my number always got picked. So I got to make a lot of uh, picture phone calls to Disneyland and having fun with that. Sorry, let me fix this again. I had scanned these originally uh, a while back and then never flipped them around. Again, they had displays of the uh, uh, exhibits that were going on. This was kind of a neat one as you talked. The lights would light up here and show the uh, pattern of your voice. How, if you were a real deep bass, bass voice or high shrilly like mine, it would light up in a particular thing. Uh, telling you how the, uh, the ear worked and how sound got from the ear and into your brain. Another slide ex exhibiting all creatures communicating, how bees communicate and how mice and rodents and all sorts of other things do. It's interesting when you get to a lot of these souvenir slides, this is an example of uh, one of the problems with them, how overexposed some of the areas uh, in the background are. They, these things, again, were mass produced, and we'll get into more with that with the photo lab slides. So they just threw them up there, zapped them out by the hundreds or by the thousands, and didn't make sure that they were properly color balanced, light balanced, or whatever. 
but they do give us some neat views of things that we're not uh, seen in most of the uh, uh, souvenirs, uh, the uh, uh, visitor slides that people take. And I get a kick out of it. 22 more telephones are installed every minute of the working day. I mean, this was coming to an area now where it wasn't just a phone in your house. It was get your trim line phone for your teenage daughter, put a phone in the garage workshop for dad. So, uh, you know, it wasn't just that they were putting more phone lines into houses, but they were putting more phones into houses. And we'll rotate this one. The tower outside the bell system, you can tell it's still early under construction. If you look down a construction wall up at the uh, uh, Travelers Pavilion and some cars down at the base of the microwave. Again, these things were done real early, sometimes before the fair opened or in the very first weeks of the fair to try to get uh, stuff out to the uh, uh, bell system family. Concept art for from Drumbeat to Telstar, the big show they did. The famous moving chairs, again, concept art, um, you know, trying to tell everybody, you come back here, what we're going to be doing, putting on these chairs, taking you through the, uh, uh, the movie. And I think they had 64 or something projectors going with it. And where was the fair? Uh, again, what's interesting with some of these is that um, I may have the entire set of slides and others uh, slide 1, 2, 3, 12, 57, 92. Still trying to figure in, in the hole, so they kind of jump all over the place at times. So the marina, model of the pavilion. And they would also tell you some of the other things you might see when you come back to uh, visit the fair. Where was it going to be? If you were not from uh, New York City, this probably wouldn't tell you very much, but a layout of the fair. What surprised me is they didn't bother to highlight on here where the Bell System Pavilion was going to be. So you had some companies like that giving away slides to their employees or making them available for PR things. Most of the pavilions did not have their own slides, but one exception here was the Billy Graham Pavilion. You could go there and get a set of uh, souvenir slides sold in plastic folders, uh, plastic sleeves. And uh, we had a uh, chance to go and buy these and bring them home. And again, it's interesting if you think of all the pavilions that people might have wanted to buy slides from, you know, uh, Futurama, they did have some Futurama slides, but they were part of other people's sets. Same with Ford, same with GE, GM. This is the only pavilion I can recall having its own set of, uh, of souvenir slides. Wonder where that sculpture from the top of the tower went. empty land where some pavilion was supposed to be. So those are, I, I think there's actually five more Billy Graham ones that I just got uh, that I haven't restored yet. So I'll have to pull them up at some time. Then we're gonna go into what's called the Mainliner Vacation Series. Uh, Mainliner was a uh, offering from United Airlines. Uh, they sold these slides uh, remember all the magazines you'd get on an airplane and they would have a, a magazine in the back seat of the back of the seat in front of you and you could buy all sorts of overpriced crazy things. Well, uh, they came up with a partnership between United Airlines, Blackhawk Films, and then uh, Photolab to produce these uh, uh, slides. They were sold in a set of 100 and there were two sets of uh, them that came out. So Photolab photographers took the pictures, they then sub-licensed it to uh, Blackhawk for reproducing, and then uh, Blackhawk uh, produced them for United Airlines that sold a mail order through the catalog. And they would also stock them on planes that if you were there, you could buy your box of 100 slides right there on the, uh, the airplane. So it's kind of interesting. Some of the views that you get are, are interesting. You, this view, for example, shows up in a whole bunch of different souvenir uh, sets from uh, Photolab and others uh, in different levels of, uh, of quality. Uh, Photolab did a real god-awful job of uh, quality control. Uh, Blackhawk was better. But Photolab is very common to see dirt and scratches and everything printed right into the photo. So you try to restore it using your digital ice on your scanner and uh, it doesn't restore because it's not a defect, it's part of the, uh, 
uh, the actual slide. But again, you can see even with Blackhawk, we did generally a pretty good job. What they got from Protolab in a number of cases was not the best. So you end up with an overexposed uh, slide, you end up with reproducing it. But the, this again was a set of 100 slides. I think it sold for around $19, $20, something like that. And it was a great way if you came back to the fair to, or if you were just thinking about the fair, buying it online or buying it after you got home from your trip, to get a whole bunch of views. And uh, if you think about it, what it cost you to take 100 pictures at the time to buy the roll of film, because there were 12, maybe 20 exposures on a roll, maybe 24 in some of the bigger ones. And then to go and get them all developed. And did you expose them right? Uh, you know, did you get them all done? Being able to buy these as a souvenir was a, a real help. Early view of GM, no shading for the crowds off to the uh, side of the building there. Love the lack of traffic in New York. No, uh, uh, what you call it, the view of the uh, Hall of Science going up yet. So they did a pretty nice job on these uh, these particular set of slides. We'll just flip through them. I'm going to be doing the Reader's Digest version of going through them, see if there's anything that's particularly unique view. Hey, Bill? Yes. So what's the style of architecture that the, of that Port Authority building that you had about three slides back? Oh, brute modern. That's pretty uh, brutalism, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. It's they pretty cool it. looking. Yeah, it's it's cool. And the, the way it was designed, if you look at it, it's a giant T shaped. You got the windows and everything. And it was, uh, you know, it's a transportation thing. So they made a big T. And then they, of course, the Port Authority put their, their name up on it. They later added signage for a terrace on the, uh, the park uh, or terrace on the fair at the time uh, because people didn't realize that there was a restaurant up there. Which I had two levels of the restaurant: the one black one up here, where the, uh, you know, the square windows, and then another dining hall down below. Up here at the top, where the uh, helicopter is now, there's yet another catering hall. Uh, used to be open for dinners, and now it's just basically used for a, a wedding, prom, you know, bar mitzvah, you know, type of catering facility. But it was a very uh, stark, uh, stark design. Down below the round area here is a uh, theater in the round of a, a movie of uh, you know uh, travel and transportation type stuff in the area. So again, this was sponsored by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. So our favorite New York State Pavilion. What was nice with this set of slides is they had very nice captions on each of the slides properly identifying what uh, each of the pavilions were. So if people uh, in the years back, you know, look at it and try to remember what it was, uh, you know, oh, it, it's right there. There are some souvenir slides we'll get to that, that basically just had a number and no description. And in some cases they have descriptions and they're, they're completely wrong. Oh, you can see, if you can see on my screen, I think on the top left, you'll see the, uh, the name of the slide going through it. GE, I, was, I just did an uh, interview the other day for uh, a blog of people asking about favorite pavilions. And they asked of all the Disney ones, which ones I enjoyed. And I said, I think the GE the most, because I, I think it had everything. It had a great show, had great characters, the technology of the entire families coming to life. Lincoln was uh, inspiring and uh, Pepsi, of course, was fun, but I still think GE the, the, was the most immersive of them all. Say Pepsi, please. Pluto's having a nice day. All the kids behind stand there and they all have little carrying cases of soda. <laughs> Poor Kodak, we knew you well. Joey's been on a kick lately for posting tower light photos. So here's a daytime view. You know, for those of us that are, you know, with Disney in our blood, you look at this and you think, wow, geez, vehicles on stage. <laughs> you just can't do that. You know, drive a pickup truck around the place. So 
The fair didn't care about that. I mean, there's this pictures I have of, you know, trash trucks right in the middle of the day and the crowd having to part out of the way because the garbage truck is just driving through the middle of the fair. I mean, what were they thinking? So today in person, we're going to see Milton Berle coming on Friday, Tony Randall and Gina Rollbridgeta Roll coming on Sunday. So they, uh, th these were all the people that are coming in to get their uh, hands uh, pr into the concrete out in front of the Hollywood USA Pavilion. Knowing that if you could look up what day Milton Berle came there, you could actually go and date some of the slides, which is helpful. And again, some of these are self-explanatory. A clear view that this was 64 because of the escorter. And that's where these things pick up some kind of neat views. This um, eagle on the side of the dynamic maturity uh, pavilion was probably some, not something that a lot of uh, people took on their own. So occasionally you do get some uh, unique views of things. Johnson Wax. I just wish some of these had been better exposed. But again, it was a great way to get a whole, uh, you know, snapshot of the fair, twenty nine ninety five or nineteen ninety five or whatever they cost. It was a very economical way to do it. I had to get one of those sound effect things where every time I do it, I can make the sound of a carousel projector changing. Kachunk. Kachunk. Or you can have Tinkerbell with her magic bell telling you to turn the page. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Another pavilion that does show up very often at all in uh, uh, Suvin home slides was the uh, Hall of Free Enterprise. It was uh, deadly dull, uh, not particularly interesting from a uh, uh, you know building point of view. And hopefully, Carol is getting the uh, the mention. Sorry for the, uh, the dog show. Anybody here ever eat at the Polynesian restaurant? I never, never got there. It was off my uh, my budget. Always looked like fun. Close-ups of the uh, Thailand Pavilion. views of the Skyway. You can see again how barren some of the landscaping was down below, both from a budget point of view and also the drought that hit New York. Wood carvings at Philippines. They uh, survived happily in a mansion on the upper north uh, shore of Long Island. They were bought by a guy that was doing the salvage work at the fair and put him in his house. So we're just going through for you folks from New Jersey. There you are. You will probably uh, know that this is the Wisconsin Pavilion, now a radio station in Wisconsin. Again, here's a real early view of the uh, fair because Dick Button's Ice Travaganza did not last very long at all. It uh, was one of the first failures of the fair to close and then uh, um, Signs were covered over in black tarps for a while, and finally they just put up new panorama signs on both sides. I got a kick out of the uh, uh, armored car over there. They had so many runs they had to make uh, out there to the fairgrounds that they uh, they did it. You know, they painted the armored car up in World's Fair colors. <clears throat> I don't imagine they were needing to pick up much receipts from Dick Button that day, though, so they they, they didn't do too well. American Israel. And again, we're just flipping through. Johnny Pirro worked here at the uh, British Lion Pub for a while. Smorgasbord, food in abundance. Something we don't see much today after COVID with buffets kind of getting uh, you know shut down, huh? 
this is kind of neat. Uh, if you look these two half circles over here, these are some of the tunnels that the tidal river that uh, forms the pool of industry would flow in and out of. And again, we've talked about it in past uh, talks though, that you would close the gate on the inside, the you know inflow gates, let the water go out with the tide. It would then expose the walkway out to the fireworks, uh, load them up all the mortars for the show, open up the gates, let the pool flood, cover up the, uh, uh, the walkways. And you didn't have to put any expensive pumps or anything in, just let mother nature drill it all out for you. But that's what those are, two, uh, two of the tunnels. This work was all carved over in Indonesia, shipped over here, and then reassembled by Indonesian architects. The side of the Central America and Panama Pavilion, go inside for your free coffee. Going over to the Mormon church with the uh, well-intended but never well-working panels to hide the A&P uh, Jane Parker sign behind it. Protestant Orthodox Center. One of the last things torn down when the ferry came down was this tower. I have pictures of the demolition phase and it's still standing there. It was left as a milestone so the uh, construction workers could find their way around the piles of ruins. Of course, the Vatican. Almost done with the main liner. This is up in Kennet Bunkport, Maine today. It was a real thrill going up there a number of years ago and seeing it on display. Christian Science Pavilion came out here to Poway, California and it's unfortunately torn down a few years ago. They try to give the building away to anybody that wanted it for free. But uh, even if you get it for free, I didn't have a big enough backyard for it. So Masons, the uh, Astral Fountain. Long, long lens of a total telephoto view going from the New York State. The astral, the aerial tower ride. And at night we see some fireworks and we say goodbye to the World's Fair. There's actually a second set of uh, the main liner. I won't jump into them right now because there's another hundred of them. So we're going to get over to Panaview, some of the better known and frankly better done views of the uh, uh, fair done in uh, souvenir slides. Folks are probably familiar with Panaviews. They're in two by two mounts, but they're in a larger square side than uh, a standard it's film. It's raining? Yeah. Hey, great. We needed some. Oh, great. It's raining outside. Yay. Yeah, the Panaviews uh, really did a nice job. Uh, they uh, unfortunately almost all have turned bright red in color, but luckily they can be restored through Photoshop. They, uh, they come back much better in color, as you can see, than some of the uh, others do. So they were sold in sleeves of, of five. Uh, and it's really interesting to see at some point, for unknown reasons, they said, oh, slide three of this set now needs to come out. We'll put another one in. So we're going to see some variations, but uh, this is uh, photo A1, so it's the set A number one. And we're just going to hop through the, the fair and take a, a nice look at things. Again, they, they did a pretty good job on these. Uh, I believe they used their own photographers because none of the uh, models in here match the uh, uh, photo lab slides. They also did a much better job in uh, exposure on them and uh, uh, getting them set for uh, uh, reproduction. As you can see, they're, they're pretty sharp. Uh, the lights are balanced out. Uh, I've done my best I can to restore the color. You can also see the New York City sky at that time was not particularly uh, bright eyed and uh, blue skies. It was uh, very, very smoggy living in New York at that time. Although we didn't call it smog in New York, they just called it sky. Manhattan off in the distance. There were many days from the fair you could not see any of that. It was just obscured and gray smut. I think most of the pan of view, if not all of them, were shot early in 64 and used throughout the run of the fair. We may spot some 65 views, but I, I don't recall that they actually did much to update the series. 
they sold pretty well, and uh, they they turn up a fair amount on the uh, the collector's market because uh, they again they were convenient. You just go and buy them. I think they were a dollar ninety nine, something like that, a set of them for uh, the five pictures. So it was it was a pretty good deal for the time. Chunky down below, you can tell that again that this was a early view because if you look where my mouse is, it was a glass tunnel here where the uh, fa uh, candy was being made down here in the candy factory. Then it would go up through the glass tunnel, go over uh, to be cooled, uh, all the chalk would cool down, and then it would go into the building here to be wrapped. And then you could come over here and buy it. Well, that was great when the fair first opened in uh, you know April, May. When they got into June and July, they found all the glass tunnel here just kept melting the candy more than cooling it as the sun hit it. So they ended up extending the roof and covering this over to keep the sun off of it. So one of those things that you, you design it, you build it, it works well, and then all of a sudden one day you realize it's back to the drawing board. Little Emmett Kelly Jr. up at the top of Kodak. Quite a crowd for General Motors. Again, you can tell it's an early shot because of uh, lack of covering for the people. But uh, you can look and see the, the size crowds that thing was do, drawing. GM having the biggest uh, number of attendees of any uh, pavilion. For our favorite, uh, fav fellow space fans, the space park was always great fun. This is again, a sort of thing, the reason I like to look back at these pictures, just look how well everybody's dressed. The ladies are dressed, you know, matching outfits and coats and they've got their high heels on. The men are all wearing suits. There's some of them wearing hats. Hats were starting to disappear at the time. Of course, you know, Kennedy had uh, gone hatless at the inauguration. Therefore, all of a sudden, people started going hatless to be like the president. But, uh, you know, people going out in suits and ties and, and uh, particularly high heels. I mean, I've obviously never worn them, but I cannot imagine walking around the fairgrounds for eight, 10 hours in high heels. Those ladies had to be tougher than I would be. Oh, the Unisphere Tower, more Unisphere. One of my favorite shots of the uh, New York State Pavilion just all lit up at night. A lot of these were done with time exposures. You can see that the flag is slightly blurry. The people on there are kind of ghostly images, but they did a really nice job, I think, of capturing all the lighting and the uh, uh, yeah, just the beauty of the, the New York State Pavilion. One for Joey. You can actually see the tower of light, ta the light going up above. GE for our Disney fans. And sort of a generic firework shot. GM changed colors. It had uh, different lights that would go at it. So sometimes you'll get a red view, sometimes a green or a blue. Vatican at night. Very, very late at night. Hardly anybody there. A few people at the phone booths who are waiting for the uh, line here for Greyhound to take you back out to your car. Robots at uh, Chrysler. And again, you can tell a time exposure from the ghostly people. Bill? Yes. Yeah. Was there any uh, point where the fair stayed open all night? Um, and not, not for guests, but like all night parties or anything like that? No, I don't think they did all nighters like, you know, we've done at uh, Disneyland or anything. It's basically, you know, most of the pavilions closed at uh, 10 o'clock at night for the, uh, you know, the, for the rides, that sort of thing. And then you could stay open, I think it was till 2 a.m. for the places, you know, had a nighttime. Uh, you know, uh, uh, feature restaurants, bars, or whatever, but there was nothing where they did a uh, an all night, uh, you know, uh, a binge. You know, come come and stay all night for twenty four hours, anything like that. Right. Thanks. They were pretty busy, I think, taking out most of the trash and cleaning up and getting stuff uh, stuff ready. Of course, me being 12 or 13 years old, I was not there at two o'clock in the morning. So I can't tell you how crowded it was at those points in time. If 
my deal with my parents is I had to be home at a reasonable period of time. And if I ever had stayed till two, that would have been my last trip to the uh, to the fair. <laughs> I probably still wouldn't be able to sit down today either, but okay. Morocco, the J Chinese junks at uh, Hong Kong. And again, these all had turned bright red, but they did a really nice job. And here's a good example of the reason the souvenir slides are real exciting. The lighting that you require to get a shot like this inside the Mexico pavilion is, is really beyond what most amateur photographers would have been able to do. I mean, yeah, how to carry a tripod with you to do a lot of these shots. And if you look through the pictures of the fair, it's very, very seldom you see somebody actually carrying a tripod. Uh, but you also would have needed a fair amount of lighting to, to you know, uh, carry some of these things off. So it's, it's great that you get some extra views of uh, the pavilions that would have been lost if not captured by uh, one of the souvenirs. Spain, Lebanon. GE shows up in a lot. And again, people so well dressed. It's just, uh, it's, it, times have changed. I mean, they, oh my God, there's somebody wearing jeans. What, what a, what a rebel. Somebody's got a black leather jacket. Must be one of those hoods we're hearing about. And we just keep flipping through these. It's again, some nice interior views uh, pop up. Small world, obviously. Every now and then you hit one that the restoration is just gonna fight you like crazy. Uh, this one was bright red. I tried to get it down as much as I could. If I ended up taking out all the red, I ended up with a black and white slide. So I just kind of left it here. So it had some semblance of color, but sometimes it's just not, I mean, this was pretty much an all white area, all the cabinets and everything. If you dial it all the way down though, it just didn't look real anymore. So I left it, you know, sometimes you just have to compromise. They even captioned this one, the Bell Telephone Flying Wing. Inside the RCA Pavilion, doing one of these shows here, we see somebody from the Bronx Zoo doing a show here about turtles. You can see them all down in the little thing down at, at the bottom there. Traveler's Insurance inside the Roman Forum exhibit. Going over to the Festival of Gas. Then we're getting near the end, so we have to have some night shots, a couple more general views. Here's a real nice view inside the uh, Ford Pavilion, something uh, that the average uh, family photographer is just not going to be able to get. You can tell this is a posed one because if you actually look at it, you notice there's nobody in any of the cars. So uh, whether it was running or not or whatever, but this shows how they had two levels of cars going through the pavilion. So you get twice the amount of people, uh, you know, with uh, being able to see it by putting two tracks, one low, one high. And then uh, a little safety thing here, if you had to evacuate, there's a little stanchions and rope from keeping it from falling into the cars down below you. And over to Chrysler. You get another view of GM. Sometimes you end up with very similar views in some of these uh, things from set to set. I'm going through the Ferris wheel. Inside GM, the city of the future, part of the Futurama exhibit. Back to the dinosaurs. We're kind of hopping around as they hop around. And this is an interesting one. This is labeled GM dinosaurs, uh, but it sure looks more like Ford to me. So again, sometimes they, they don't quite get them right. GM City of the Future, they got that one right. Very, very quiet day at the fair. Good target day for our time machine test. And getting just down near the end of uh, Panaviews.
this little train to the Long Island Railroad exhibit. You can still ride it today out in uh, Suffolk County, Long Island. It's uh, very nostalgic. They restored it, and it's in. Uh, it's great fun to sit out there and drive around on it. Did that a number of years ago. New Jersey, Spirit of St. Louis inside of Missouri. New Mexico. This model over at Oklahoma was kind of neat because things actually moved the little boats in the center. You can see moved around a little track with little water skiers behind them and cows in the stockyard bob their heads up and down. So it was kind of an interesting map. Or to Lincoln, Maryland, the monorail. Not the Hall of Presidents. This is Walter's Wax. The uh, they had all the presidents there in a wax museum. We're into the last set of these, the Hell Drivers. Log from Ryan. In the background, the exciting world of Franksville, which if people did never went there, it was a hot dog place. So it was a very, very uh, popular spot to go and grab a quick meal. And it was a competition to the brass rails. But Franksville was the attempt to do a uh, franchise like McDonald's. And the guy had hoped to build Franksville's all across the United States and got about six of them built and found out people would prefer to go to a hot dog, or, sorry, a hamburger fast food place much more than they wanted to go to a hot dog one. So and that was the last one. This ends up our, our view of the uh, uh, pan of views. So we're going to hop over here now to Photolab. And Photolab was the big vendor, as I mentioned. Uh, they did an awful lot of stuff with it. You got a lot of their slides you could buy in little uh, envelopes of 10, uh, or you could buy them in a box. And so you could get your 50 color slides of the New York World's Fair, and you could uh, get them with a souvenir viewer. Uh, so you got this little plastic box, and it had this magnifying glass and a plastic lid you could put your slide in and light it up. They also sold the uh, individual uh, viewers with some slides. And a number of the fair uh, pavilions actually bought these in bulk and gave them away as gifts to VIPs. So uh, the little plastic viewer shows up an awful lot on eBay auctions and that because they turn them out by the, the zillions. We're going to go back and show you if you're going to build a World's Fair and you want to show slides on the day it opens, but you don't have anything built yet, what do you do? You get people to come out and buy your uh, artist renderings. So uh, when you first got to the fair, uh, this is what you would buy. Matter of fact, they were selling these mail order even before the fair opened uh, for people that were getting excited. And a lot of what PhotoLab did was then they sold these to the people who were participating in the fair so they could give them away to their uh, executives, their VIPs, their, their people to get interested in it. So it, it gives us a neat chance to see how the fair looked from a conceptual point of view. Famous poster by Bob Peak of uh, the Unisphere and happy family going out there to visit. As I mentioned, Photolab is the company you love to hate. Uh, they, uh, they didn't bother with things like sharp focus on a bunch of their slides, dirt scratches. Uh, some of these are just a bear and a half to restore. Photolab was the big, big guy on the block though. So everybody had to deal with them. And uh, I started thinking what, whatever became of all the Photolab uh, pictures. You know, if they did pr pr uh, print these and they didn't do them real sharp, like this one's a bit on the blurry side, whatever became of the negatives, is there any chance of finding them and being able to get, uh, you know, better copies of them? So I went on a quest to, uh, to try to track PhotoLab down, and it turned out that uh, they lasted until the uh, 80s or I remember it was late 80s, early 90s, and then they went uh, bankrupt. And uh, they were based in Washington, D.C., and uh, I tried to track them down and, and found out all their assets were sold off by order of the court and uh, no particular records that I could find. It might be buried somewhere in a courthouse in uh, Washington, D.C., <clears throat> where the, uh, uh, the stuff went. But the, only, the last record I found was somebody being murdered in the ruins of the photo lab factory, which was sitting derelict in uh, Washington, D.C. And after the murder, the uh, city leaders decided they would finally raise the building. And the last I knew, it was a vacant, empty lot. 
So somewhere, hopefully, somebody bought all these great negatives and these great pictures of the photo lab stuff. But uh, if anybody knows where they are, they, they have proven to, impossible for me to locate. This particular set, by the way, was all done in the larger side uh, of the, uh, just like the uh, 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 Panaview slides done large two by two images. So that you notice they're all basically of a square type motif, not the 35 millimeter uh, rectangle. Meadow, uh, the photographic headquarters, they ended up with a neat deal having the exclusive rights to sell film on the uh, fairgrounds. They worked that out with Kodak. Kodak under antitrust laws wasn't able to sell film directly to people, so they had to sell it to a wholesaler. Meadow came up with the uh, con contract. Then they would then later subsell it to other people if you were buying it at a brass rail or other places through the fairgrounds. So uh, kind of a neat little contract and they benefited from the antitrust laws. So again, most of these uh, pavilions came out pretty much like we saw. We're gonna see some designs that are way off uh, in, uh, in, in the concept from what they were building. But for this particular set, they, they pretty much match what was, uh, was being built out in Flushing Meadows. Hall of Education is one that shows uh, what you can do on a paintbrush. You can make it very interesting. All of this artwork or this uh, 3D sculpture on the front of it was not part of the real uh, pavilion being built. Uh, the pavilion was uh, downsized quite a bit as uh, you know budgets came to be. But again, if you're trying to get people to participate, you, you paint, paint a pretty picture and get them to write as many checks as they can, and then you build to match. All of science came out much better than this uh, concept art comes and shows. This shows all solid concrete walls, as we know, was built with uh, inset blue glass blocks that provide some uh, beautiful lighting inside, but also gave the walls a much nicer texture on the outside. And we're just flipping through near the last of these. And people snap these up. Again, when you got to the fair, if you were the first people to come, oh, then you get some slides were really great. You got six for the price of one. You can see here examples of how things changed down below. Kodak had a, a very different look on the way that was uh, done from uh, uh, the original tower with the, uh, the, the giant slides. But again, if you were one of the first people out at the fair the first month or so, and you wanted to take uh, slides and bring them home, these are the sort of things you would buy. And it's, it's great when you come home with a souvenir slide that shows you the Clearview Expressway and the Grand Central Parkway. I mean, I'm sure the folks back in Ohio just were thrilled to get that view of, uh, of you know, your, your trip. Brass Rail Snack Bar. You notice that it did not have any uh, balloons on it. So they initially designed it. They uh, decided that it wasn't particularly eye-catching. What do we do uh, that's going to be cheap? Hey, let's get a bunch of balloons and a bunch of electric fans and put a, a, a giant set of bubbles on top of it. So interesting to see how things change. So that was their first set of slides. And again, that was uh, called architects renderings. Well, that wasn't enough because now they got into more architects renderings of attractions. So again, we can go out and we can see uh, different concept art everything for the uh, Unisphere, because it was donated by United States Steel, the copyright was you had to say Unisphere presented by United States Steel. So, uh, and then down below the, uh, the copyright notice. So any of these uh, particular things, Unisphere uh, slides, you'll often see the United States Steel and they were kind of zealous on making sure they got credit everywhere because they spent a fortune to design and build that thing. You know, it was obviously not making money but if you build it for publicity, you want to make sure that you go in and get your publicity. So again, concepts, I, I don't know what kind of cars these are supposed to be. It kind of looks like the Black Beauty out of the Green Hornet or something, but uh, the entrance pylons, they ended up being all white. They didn't go with the colored panels that they, uh, they, they showed here. What kind of neat artwork. Some of this stuff was pretty neat. Uh, you had guys like Harper Goff, who was uh, famous for doing the uh, 20,000 Leagues 
uh, uh, Nautilus, uh, also the Jungle Cruise at Disneyland, boats and a lot of the design, did a lot of the concept uh, art for these. So you can see things that you can sort of recognize like the solar fountain, you'll not recognize the fountain, uh, the pavilions on either side because they never got built. Here's one that Harper did. This shows a, a concept for a United Nations Plaza when you can see the UN flags and uh, or a symbol on either side of it. Lunar fountain again, pavilions that didn't get built, kind of a neat designs or what ifs. And some things did get built. This again is that round part hanging down underneath the uh, uh, trans uh, the uh, Port Authority teleport. So a uh, helicopter coming in over here on the side, coming in for a landing. I hope he goes up a little higher than before he gets over to the uh, cocktail lounge. The brass rail, nice and shiny white balloons. So again, this was a set of slides that uh, people could come out and buy in these uh, little envelopes that came out. And uh, we'll go and see some more architects' renderings. So the Auto Thrill Show, Ringland Brothers Circus. Again, uh, sometimes this is an example of uh, how things varied. This is how they framed it in one uh, time, where the word circus is cut off down below. Then you would buy the exact same set of slides, uh, or thinking you're buying the exact same set of slides, and you would get another one where it was framed completely differently. And we'll see that in some of the other photo labs where they were way off. So again, this just to me is again why I, I say it's the company I love to hate. I love that they captured so much of this, but if this is the properly framed slide, how hard would it have been to do it right on this one and, and just get it done right? But they, they just told, turned them out by the thousands, so I guess they didn't care. Texas Music Hall. Whoops, went real fast. Mutiny on the Bounty, one year exhibit that was over at the marina. Dancing Waters. Ended up being a giant inflatable dome. I don't know if this one was supposed to be an inflatable dome or a uh, permanent, you know, hard shell building or not. Again, the boring Hall of Free Enterprise. Inside the New York City Pavilion, you could go and see all sorts of displays on how New York City bureaucracy worked. The Singer Bowl never got quite those fancy lights that they show up there. Another example of how things changed quite a bit. Transportation travel didn't look like this. Matter of fact, there's some other uh, views that looks even more different than this without the giant moon dome on there. But when you're starting to go off to your uh, 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 investors, you have to show something which, what their interior uh, exhibits would be in. I got to kick the artist on this one was named, known as Tesla. You can see his name there. So uh, don't know if, if he did any others for the fair. The International Plaza looks pretty spiffy, doesn't it? Pretty neat. Reminds me very much of the international area that was done at the uh, 62 Seattle World's Fair which is probably not a coincidence because a lot of times they just took, uh, took things for inspiration. I won't go through all these. Let me jump up to this one. It's kind of interesting. I wanna have, oh, this one I'm gonna have to flip over here. I don't have this whole set, uh, but you could go and buy souvenir slides of the Greyhound information booth at the fair or the Marina Administration Building. And that's where some of these show up all the time, the same sets of 10 over and over and over. Uh, th there's 10 of them in this set. I've only managed to find two so far, but it gives you something to keep, uh, keep going and looking for. So you could also then go uh, uh, and buy Belgian Village slides. These were sold at the Belgian Village, uh, again, done by Photolab. And again, I, I should have gone through this last night. I didn't realize how many of these I didn't have flipped around. But this was a, again, sort of plastic uh, sleeve of slides you could buy out at the Belgian village. A nun standing on her side, we'll fix her. The ever present nun visiting the, the fair. The dancers. Why they had just one set of four slides, I don't know, but they, they sold them out there under the photo lab label. Another set that's very hard to get here is the General uh, Motors Futurama. For some reason, 
very seldom does this one show up, but you could go and buy these or GM likely bought them in bulk and gave them away to dealers, but we get some nice views of the, the pavilion. Again, the sort of thing that you're not gonna get with your Brownie Instamatic or your Kodak 126 or anything. Uh, you're not gonna, first of all, you're not gonna get this close to it. Second of all, they probably stopped it for you so you didn't get any motion and that they probably turned the lights on for you. So it's a, a, a different uh, closer world. Out in the Antarctic, drilling for natural resources up there. What a great model, huh? I mean, this thing was massive. It was really a, a, a tremendous way to see the future that we're all gonna be living in with our freeways. And you start looking, how many lanes are in some of these freeways, you know? And, uh, you know, in this particular one, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, six sets of different freeways at different levels going different directions. And everything was gonna be computerized and spaced out and, and very nice. Not a lot of greenery in this city, though, is there? And we were going to be up on the moon by then, mining that for minerals. We were going to be tearing down the Amazon and putting highways everywhere. Back to the Antarctic. Or underseas. Sort of reminds me of uh, Horizons you know, uh, the underwater pavilions there. So what else from Photo Lab do we want to take a look at here? Let's see what else we got. Um, oh, then it was interesting. Photo Lab then started putting out some, uh, well, we'll take a look here, super scenic slides. These were done to, uh, uh, actually, I'll, I, maybe I'll skip through some of these, um, just because some of these, well, here, this shows you an example of, again, some of the, uh, the framing issues on some of these. I haven't finished restoring all these. You can see this one got attacked by some mold and everything, but here's one view that you get here of, of a, uh, a view. And this is the exact same slide sold by them under the exact same name. So look how different the, uh, the two building. So you buy two sets of these and uh, you know set slide number one, Greyhound. This, you get this view and you get that view. So they, they just didn't uh, make a lot of attention on how they, they sold these things out. So at times they would sell, uh, you know, different uh, variations on it. These are all in my to be restored pile. But some of them are kind of neat views. One for Joey. And as I mentioned, if I zoom in on this one, this is the example of photo lab quality control. So all of this dirt that you see on here is dirt printed on the original slide that when I get to it, I will have to take them out, blotting out spot by spot by spot by spot, because you can't use infrared cleaning on it because it is not dust or dirt. It's, you know, on the uh, picture, it's dust or dirt in the picture. And again, here, and again, examples of some of this stuff. If we zoom in on this, you end up all sorts of crud. This, the, the kind of purplish thing is mold, but they're all the rest of it, dirt scratches and everything are the way they, they would sell these things. Because I guess people just didn't, uh, didn't think about, you know, high def type things. And if you're looking at it across the, uh, the living room, it might be a, dip, a bit different. Um, then I'd hop over to another vendor here, Rolock. Rolock was a, a, a fellow that did this as a, a side business. He was actually a lieutenant commander in the United States Navy. His name was ARPS, A-R-P-S. And he did a, a, a offering of selling slides. These were unofficial slides, not uh, sold at the fairgrounds, but he did an amazing job. ARPS went off and uh, he did these for uh, the Expo 58. Seattle World's Fair, uh, the uh, uh, Expo 67, and he did a mail order business. And these slides, you could uh, buy a catalog and he sold them, I think they were 10 cents each. And he, uh, he did frankly an outstanding job of uh, taking uh, pictures at the fair. Uh, he was an excellent photographer. And he also did a very nice job in his framing and his lighting exposure. Here we're inside the Schaefer Pavilion. You can see the buffet there and the fountains. 
So uh, Arps did a, a great job. Uh, he unfortunately has passed away and his heirs, I've tried contacting them, had no interest in continuing going with the, uh, you know, selling the, the selling any of his stuff uh, for business or anything. But uh, again, all unofficial stuff, all he, these are things he all took as a uh, amateur. I have most of the ARP slides for the 64 fair. I don't have them all. I do have his catalog and every now and then there's some others I'm still looking for. But uh, Roloc, again, R-O-L-O-C, happens to be color spelled backwards. And uh, I really admire what he, uh, he turned out. And he, uh, his catalogs are, uh, I've got them online on my site. They're frankly fascinating for some of the, the views that he got. So again, uh, inside the India Pavilion, he, he did carry a tripod, did do a, a, a very nice job of, of uh, you know, capturing these and, uh, you know, making them available. His Roloc slides of uh, Expo 67 are so far superior to the uh, commercial uh, ones that were sold by uh, Bellevue, the official licensee of Expo 67, that they, uh, they basically you know, just put it to shame. He also used a very good uh, film stock uh, that did not deteriorate like many of the uh, Panaviews, that they did not go bright red. He, like everybody else, had some challenges getting the Pieta, um, you know, do the best you can. But uh, his film stock held up uh, pretty well. Uh, you know, does require some uh, some work, but nothing like the uh, the others do inside the American Israel. And unlike the uh, uh, fellows over at uh, Photo Lab, he did not print dust and scratches and dirt on his stuff. So uh, my my hat goes off to Lieutenant Commander Arp. He uh, for again, he was full-time Navy officer. Did this as a part-time hobby. I think he. Uh, I don't know quite what he did for the Navy. Maybe he was a photographer, but he did a, a heck of a job for us uh, fans of the fair. Astral Fountain in motion. So it's kind of interesting to see uh, how it blurred uh, with the uh, cage rotating around. Well, let me rotate this one around. There we go, back. Nice view of New York State and its pristine days. Very nice view of Westinghouse. We caught a really good view of all the displays that they had there. And then the uh, capsule hanging up above, waiting to be lowered down to the ground. <clears throat> Not a bad job for an amateur inside a moving vehicle inside a Ford. I'll rotate this one. Space park. Originally, I left the ones that were sideways that way. So if people wanted to print them as they made copies, then it was easier. But uh, over time, I've been rotating them back, like here. Okay, here we go. Occasionally he caught things like one of the forms in motion sculpture stuff off to the side. Today he might want to nuke that with Photoshop, but and most of his shots are pretty good. Occasionally he got into some like up here in the upper left, some vignetting, whatever lens he was using. Uh, but he, he did a pretty good job. And over here, there's something dark up in the sky. And my first thought was, oh, he got some dirt. No, it's a bird flying by, so I left left his bird in there. Upstairs in the Port Authority, the top of the fair restaurant. We walked through it one day with my folks, and I think that was about it. Again, not on a 12 year old kids uh, go to the fair budget. GM. Isn't that just a great view? I mean, he got it so clear and so sharp, and just what a great view of all the pavilions and everything laid out. Helicopter ride, Skyway ride.
Again, things were just being built. This was taken in the very early days of the fair. You could still see some of the material that they were building off to the left. And the name of the builder, his sign has been taken down, but is laying across the, uh, the edge of the walls here. And here's his uh, catalog here of uh, what he could get. So in this particular set, you know, it goes through and describes all the slides of what they were here. I won't go through each of them, but it was very nice that he gave you a uh, uh, description. And we had one other set of slides I just want to go through. This was a company called Wolf, W-O-L-F-E, -O -O -E, Worldwide Films. They did a, a set of slides just like uh, Mr. Arp uh, that were mail order. So you could go off and buy these. Uh, and a number of years ago, uh, Wolf found a, a bunch of their slides, digitized them, and started selling them on uh, CD. So uh, besides the one I collected, the physical ones, for a while they were selling them on uh, CD, but they appear to have gotten back out of that business. But again, these were unofficial ones that they took. Uh, and uh, sometimes they got the, the, the captions totally wrong. but. They, they did their best, but kind of neat views, old subway ads riding out to the fair. And I think they, again, they sold these for about 10, 15 cents each, and they had the same deal as ARPS. You could get their catalog and you could say, I want to buy one of this, one of that. So again, if you notice, they skip around 79010 and 79014. Well, I started trying to figure out where were 11, 12, and 13. How do I ever find them? Well, it turned out they never printed them all. So they assigned numbers to them all, they didn't print them all, and it, it makes it very hard then to know which ones uh, are still missing in the never ending quest to tr try to find them all. So if you notice the slides are not as nicely done as uh, ARPS, they're, they're still more on the blurry side, but they did not have a lot of the defects in them that uh, the photo lab ones did. The model of the fair inside the uh, American Express Pavilion and they hop all over the place. If there's any rhyme or reason to uh, what, you know, how they were shot pattern wise, I've never found it. But uh, neat view, the escort are going by and again, very well dressed people. They did not use as good a color stock as ARPS did. The colors faded quite a bit. Um, this is the uh, mural that's uh, Protestant Orthodox Church, which has now been relocated and is here in beautiful downtown Granada Hills, California. The uh, people that uh, I have mentioned in past talks about how the church got in touch with me, wanted to know if I had any pictures of from the fair. The church was since sold since then. It was a big concern that they were going to tear it down. Luckily, another church bought it had no connection to the uh, fair and the, uh, the same, uh, it's a different denomination that uh, uh, owns the church today, but they've decided to keep and maintain the uh, mural. So if any of you ever come out here to California and you wanna go visit the uh, mural, I'll be glad to hop you over there. It's a, a whopping two and a half miles from my house. Nice view of the Pieta showing the uh, bulletproof glass protecting it from the crowds. And a nicer view without the glass. So again, Wolf Wolf had a, a pretty good set of uh, slides, uh, Denmark here. And they're all totally different than the uh, um, the photo lab ones because they sent their own guerrilla photographers in and sold these things uh, offline. Uh, it was interesting because photo lab, of course, then tried to stop uh, Wolf from doing it, and uh, they didn't have very much luck uh, because these things were, uh, although they had a license to sell it on the fair, they didn't have an exclusive license to sell it anywhere in the world. So Wolf did a pretty good job selling these. Wolf also sold not just World's Fair slides. You could go, and this is a nice view of the Seven Up Gardens, uh, again, the buffet, all the little plastic plates, which if any of those uh, of you have them, you know that they're very brittle. They've oxidized over time. So you gotta be really careful, you don't know, drop your seven up plate because it will chip even though it's uh, you know, plastic. But again, they were intended to last for you know, two years and we're 50 plus years later. But just look at the time, I'll zip through these real quick. Hilton International Cafe, uh, again, up at the, the top of the uh, Better Living Center. Inside the Coke Pavilion. 
I wish they would put those flags back on the uh, bridges. If you walk over the bridges, you can see the bolt holes in the ground where they were, uh, you know, there during the time of the fair. If they put them back, it would be pretty neat. And then again, you might notice, mention this other talk, there is no national flags up there or anything. They're just wild geometric uh, colors and patterns, purely to catch the eye. Uh, the, all the international and state flags were done in the court of the nations or the court of the states. And we have some other closer views they got here from other pavilions. Again, Ford, they didn't do quite a good job as Mr. Arps, but they got a view that he didn't get, the load on load area. GM, crowds ways for Futurama tour. Man, I can remember standing in that thing, you know, over and over and over. It was just, uh, just great. You know, over time, they ended up putting stanchions and ropes and everything in. This was the real early days of the fair, and they were absolutely overwhelmed by the number of people that they got. But can you imagine trying to do crowd control and get all these people to funnel in through a set of double glass doors into the building? I love the look of this guy down here on the bottom. They're all staring at the photographer. So you wonder what he was saying. He certainly didn't seem to be saying smile. You know? Again, sitting inside, now you've gotten in Futurama. The guard looks a little suspicious. They probably told you no flash photography, but you took one anyway. Father and dog. Since my dog is sitting here in my lap at the moment, I know how he feels with his constant companion. Going upstairs in GE, the Hall of Escalators. And Spanish Pavilion, Albert Fisher's favorite restaurant to eat at the fair. Going through the bell system. I don't know who the guy standing here in the back is, probably a maintenance guy or something, but the immortalized. Now we're getting near the end of these, the fountains, Belgian Village. Be interested to know if she ever became anybody famous. And they did update theirs for 65. Uh, again, this was the uh, former The Pavilion changed to Winston Churchill tribute for 65. So they did show some uh, additional ones in here. Interior Blenheim Palace model, exhibits of uh, his cartoons and things like that. Matter of fact, they did quite a bit of adding the 65 for, for Mr. Churchill, and that was the end of it. So with that, I think I will stop sharing here. If I can find my meeting controls. Yep, stop share. And I saw, oh my goodness, 27 things in the chat. I made that many mistakes. We'll see what we got here. So I'm reading through it. If people have any particular thoughts, feel free to chime in. Yeah, another, uh, every time you duplicate a film frame, you increase contrast. That was the, the trouble on some of these things is that, you know, you wonder you know, how, when they did it, did they go back to an original negative and keep flashing light through it a thousand times? And, you know, what it did to the original negative, uh, you know, what did it do to that? Uh, plus, you know, uh, uh, again, if you were just doing it by the thousands, you didn't have time to adjust. You just threw it in there, hit the button, threw it in there, hit the button, threw the, you know, and just keep going on. Yeah, aerial shots, a big advantage of souvenir slides, that's for sure. Uh, if, even if you did take the Port Authority helicopter ride, you didn't get to hang out the window and get a shot like uh, some of these guys did. Don Lancaster also said brutalism, so I'm glad I wasn't the only one that thought of that. Pizzazz, yeah, just reading through these. A Facebook page called Architecture Shaming and the Port Authority building show up a lot. Really, people didn't like it, huh? Well, it's just one of many that they show. And then, but that one in particular they showed, and that was where I first learned about brutalism. Somebody said, that's brutalism. And that started an entire discussion about, no, that's not brutalism. Here it is. So, yeah. It's a junkie building. It really is. Yeah, but it did what it needed to do. It had to hold a heliport, so you had a certain thing you had to do, a certain design. 
you know, what I get a kick out of is how the, the 64, the critics hated the architect uh, the architecture of the 64 fair. And to me, that was what kind of what made it really neat was that you went out there and, you know, who was going to build a giant dome or a giant T-shaped building or something in downtown Brooklyn, you know, you know, or downtown, I think was living in Baldwin at the time. We didn't have buildings like that. We didn't have, you know, uh, giant, weird, crazy buildings. So I, I like the weird architecture myself. Oh, you know, it's I'm not like, that. It's what I said in my comment that it's it's pavilion architecture designed for fair function. Right. Uh, you know, and and you just don't want to put a, you know, a, a square building out in the middle of the pavilion without any pizzazz on it because it's not going to attract any attention. But in relationship to me, at least in relationship to the other the other pavilions, it's um, static because it's it's symmetrical on all sides. Right. And yes, it serves a function. It's got the restaurant. It's got the platform for the helicopter on the top. They could have said, well, let's just put the platform for the helicopter on the ground. And then somebody said, well, no, let's elevate it. OK, and then what are we going to do? Well, let's put a revolving restaurant under it. I guess it revolves. You know, no, and it, you know, it make it revolve. a. It doesn't revolve, okay. And it makes it a, you know, and make it an attraction for people to want to go see. Right. But in relationship to everything else, it's just kind of like a static, you know, building. And I think maybe that's why it's. I, I don't hate it. I don't just think it. I don't think it's the greatest building. I mean, huh, you know, it's not, not the greatest. It's one of the few survivors, though. Well, I think that's because of its function, isn't it? Still used for the helipad? No, no, the helipad. Oh. Got, it, it, the helipad was never used after '65, and up on the roof now, there's a whole nother uh, catering hall, so you couldn't land a helicopter up there even if you wanted to. Well, maybe it's a maybe it's another spaceship, you know, <laughs> like like Joey's two spaceships, you know, yeah. from Men in Black. Maybe it's another spaceship. That that could be. <laughs> There's a question about Panaview uh, holding a slide up here. This was basically the way they looked. Again, a very large square size slide. So you had a lot more picture area. If you look at the, uh, the difference between the two, the one on, on this uh, one here is the Panaview type side. This is, again, a 35 millimeter. It had approximately, I think, 25% more uh, image area in the Panaview slide than in the 35 millimeter. So that made it uh, a really nice thing that you get a much bigger view, uh, a whole different format. So you had to shoot a totally different format, but you got uh, basically a lot more image for your, your buck. So uh, the, the pan of views, the uh, photo lab also sold uh, uh, what you call it, super scenic slides that were in cardboard. The pan of views were in plastic mounts and the super scenic slides were in uh, uh, cardboard mounts, but they were again, the, the same uh, pan of view slide uh, uh, format. Hey, Bill. Yeah. Uh -huh. I heard of the, uh, all the pan of views you showed today somewhere on your CDs. Sorry, what was that about the pan of views? I missed the last part. Uh, are they somewhere on your CDs? Yeah, yeah. I think it's CD number four. I sell uh, basically all these souvenir slides on, uh, I think it's CD number four commercial <clears throat> slides from the fair. The, the reason I ask is because I have that one, but uh, one of the interiors you showed and commented on the lighting, I think it was Mexico, I spotted a, a RCA TV, so I have to add that to my list. Yeah, it's, uh, it's on there. And again, I, I do a, so if you go to my site, Again, worldsfairphotos.com on the 64 page, there's a whole thing on the uh, souvenir slides. I try to have a checklist of all the ones that I have or that I know about for each vendor. If anybody knows of any that I don't have, please let me know. But I also did a, a page in all the uh, pan of views and including in there how they took a you know, slide out and put this slide in, you know, so that instead of there being five for this particular one, there's six slides, but two with the same number. So. Uh, yeah, just just go and look on the uh, World Fair photos uh, under my page for uh, souvenir slides. And Kathy asked, did the Unisphere copyright expire? Yeah, that was again an amazingly stupid thing by the city of New York. 
uh, when the fair uh, Unisphere, United States Steel assigned the copyright to the Fair Corporation, when the Fair Corporation was dissolved, they gave it to the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, which was one of Robert Moses' other agencies. So they had the, the copyright and they just didn't renew it. They just totally, for the whatever $35 filing fee or whatever, they totally let it lapse. So now, you know, everybody that you see, if people stick it on the side of their, uh, their business or stick it in ads or whatever, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's free going. So, uh, you know, then I, I did do a full copyright search uh, through the US government and, you know, somewhere over the time they, they just let it expire. Tribar Bridge and Tunnel Authority. Now, somebody there probably didn't know that they had it, but you know, it, uh, <laughs> it's still amazing to me. You could have a, imagine, you know, the intellectual value of that piece of, you know, the, the, the value of that piece of intellectual property and, uh, you know, they just let it go. So uh, let's see. Love the skid marks. Which one was that on, Carolyn? One of the roads? Uh, it, it was one of the art, artist conceptions and they were pulling up to a plaza of some kind and all oh, okay. and there were all these cars and there were just skid marks. I, I, th I think they meant they were supposed to be tire tracks, but what would they be tracking through? So I, they look like skid marks. There are actually some slides you can find at the fair where there are skid marks and it was like, uh, what, you know, what, how, who was driving at night or, you know, whatever that did it. Uh, you know, there's also pictures I have like of one of the clock towers out in the fair grounds that's bent all the way over the side because somebody smacked into it at night, you know, that sort of thing. So you figure that, you know, the trash trucks going through there or people that were driving through after leaving happy hour or something. But yeah, there's a couple of spots you can see skid marks right, you know, in the middle of the fairgrounds. And you wonder, they probably lasted quite a while because it wouldn't be a lot to wear them off and, and take them out of there. Or to drag races or something. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a round restaurant did not rotate. It depends on how many drinks you had. Very good, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they missed a bet with uh, what you call it, making it rotate. But again, uh, you know, it was cheaper that way, right? Just reading through all these here. The Frisbee demonstration stage. Yeah, I haven't found that either, uh, Ken. We know. It was some things just don't show up like a uh, an, an awful lot of stuff, you know. Uh, you know the, the go karts that were there in '65 uh, over next to the uh, uh, Pavilion of American Interiors, you know. There's a couple shots of those, and they actually go kart races. They encourage people to come from out of town and come in there and participate in go. They had like the you know Indy 500 of go karts there in the fairgrounds. So they had both the go-karts on the uh, uh, Avis track, but you had a whole separate one over by American Interiors that they did you know, real races over there. So uh, <clears throat> I guess when we've talked about it in the past, we've narrowed it down to probably being in the Better Living Center, but I've been searching for years trying to find a shot of it. And I've got the Frisbee and I, I know I didn't imagine it. It you know, says 65 World's Fair on it. And I think other folks here may, may have it too, but Mary, uh, even a blurry or underexposed shot that I've ever seen. Yeah, no, I mean, American Interiors, uh, you know, uh, I, I do have, or a better living center, I do have some shots of different things in it. But, you know, if you remember that pavilion, it was it was really just like going through Ikea, you know, <laughs> start at the top and they made you go by every single pavilion. And some of them were kind of interesting, but, you know, the Canada Dry thing was like, well, that's real interesting. A bunch of bubbles coming up through water. I just want to get out of this damn building. So uh, it was not a bu building people took a lot of pictures in. And hopefully, you know, did you ever try, as a thought, Kenneth, track down Frisbee Corporation and ask them? That's an idea. I've never done that. Yeah, because they, they may have it in the archives there somewhere. You may find your holy grail. <laughs> Because I think Frisbees were done by Whammo Corporation, and I think Whammo is still around. Uh, they might have gotten bought out by Mattel, but even there, you know, they, somebody someplace might have it. So, yeah, we're all, everybody, put up your hands if you want to sign Kenneth to the quest of <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I know when I've walked into the <laughs> Anybody else want to venture any memories? <laughs> While, while I have you all, just uh, two things to mention. Uh, next week, we're going to be taking a look at uh, Hemisphere 68, 
the uh, San Antonio World's Fair. I went through the presentation with Christopher yesterday and uh, uh, he is an absolute wizard and uh, uh, knowledgeable on it. He's made a, a pattern of going out and doing a lot of oral interviews with uh, people that actually built the fair, operated and ran it. And when I went through it with him yesterday, there were things I thought I knew about the fair that he just, wow, that was a real piece of surprise. So uh, I, I think it's gonna be a real interesting look next week on uh, um, you know, Hemisphere 68. It was, uh, uh, I didn't realize, for example, that they ran out of money uh, midway through the fair and had to desperately go and get more money to, uh, to do it. And turn out they had a guy on their board and uh, you know, Christopher can tell you more about how all of a sudden everybody looked to him and said, help, you know? And he was <laughs> able to help keep a hemisphere open. I mean, I, I knew that, uh, you know, Expo 84, the uh, you know, uh, New Orleans World's Fair had run into real pr trouble but the uh, hemisphere had, uh, and, and I think about halfway through it, running the point where the checks were going to start bouncing. So he'll be going into some of that next week, and also where the pavilions are, what they're doing, and he has a neat thing on what the site is today and the work that is just underway to revitalize it more. So I invite you uh, to join us for Hemisphere uh, 68. And also, she didn't know I was going to mention her, but Kathy uh, Perone, maybe you'd like to mention your upcoming event for. Uh, uh, folks that are not familiar with it, haven't seen it posted on uh, Facebook yet, you sh should find an unmute button there somewhere, or there you go. Is that it? Oh, yeah, yeah. we're come along, coming along well. We've got a lot of unexpected visitors. The Queens Museum may, may send someone out, um, and we're, gosh, about seven weeks out. So things are looking up, and uh, we'd love to have you all join us. Yeah, if they're not uh, generally familiar with it, why don't you just, just mention what, where, when, why, that sort of stuff? Oh, okay. Well, we're at the Disneyland Hotel, the, the prettiest room on property, the Slayton Beauty Pavilion, second floor Disneyland Hotel, uh, Saturday, March 5th, and $158 will include a breakfast buffet, a lunch buffet, parking, which is higher than all of that, and uh, Let's see, we have Bob Gurr, we have um, Garner Holt, we have our own Albert Fisher, we have uh, Phil Bueller with the demolition of the fair, uh, Greg Airbar, who uh, is gonna surprise us. I don't know if we're getting into the music of the fair or Disney music in the 60s. Uh, and gosh, Marcy Carricker Smothers is gonna uh, be a guest there. And if you have any of her books, she'd love to sign them for you. Um, Joanna Miller um, has accepted the invitation. I believe she's coming with her son, Nick. Who else? Uh, so we have, we have lots of surprises, prizes, games, uh, midway. And uh, yeah, it, it, you know, you can reach me via the uh, flyer on on my page or on bill's world's fair page we'd love to have you yeah we had uh, tried to do this last year and covid raised its uh, ugly head so uh everybody fingers crossed that uh it's seven weeks now wow it's time yeah, coming up. i know it it was forever <laughs> yeah so, crazy two um, weeks from now if you're in the mood i'm going to be giving a talk to the uh, disney family uh, museum on uh, zorro uh, folks have seen much of Zorro uh, before, but we're going to be showing uh, some footage of a uh, of guy that's not been shown on online before. So encourage people to join us. That's on uh, January 28th, 5.30 Pacific. And uh, I appreciate the fact that I know at least two of you became members of the museum, so you knew you could get a ticket. I keep telling you, I'd come to your house and do it for half the price. Oh, Bill? Yes. I unmute. Uh, yeah. I forgot to. How could I forget? We're gonna kick the uh, the day off with uh, Guy Williams Jr., Bill Cal uh, Steve Catalano, uh, our Azoro presentation to to kick off breakfast. So that's another thing we have coming in. Uh oh. It should be a fun day. I'm looking forward to it. We're just again keeping the fingers crossed. We may all be there wearing hazmat suits or space suits or something, but uh, it, it should be fun. Evans. What's the name of the event, if you don't mind my asking? Uh, remembering the future. Ah, yeah, we've been looking for that. Thank you. Yeah, great.
you need a, a, a excuse to come out to California, this is the, a good one to go do it. And if you're out in California, I'll take you and show you the church in Granada Hills. What a deal. Hey, package deal. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Hey, Bill, I got my membership materials from the museum, uh, along with the two guest tickets for people you can bring along when you visit, which would be more useful if I was on that side of the country. But I noticed we got an email uh, a couple of days after that that said, Oh, now you can bring a friend every time you visit. I was like, oh, even more stuff I can't use. <laughs> so definitely going to have to get out there and visit sometime. <laughs> you know, in our pantry, we have a calendar and a cork board. And in there, there's two tickets to the museum stuck in there with a, uh, uh, you know, uh, a pin, you know, a, pin, a thumbtack, you know, saying, oh, someday when we're back up that way. Because uh, when we go up that way, I, I can usually call them and they say, oh, sure, just come on in, that sort of thing. But uh, you know, if, if folks haven't seen the Disney Family Museum, it's really worthwhile. We went up there a couple of years ago uh, when I was up there uh, doing a, a visits for the, uh, taking a, a talk that I was doing up there. And Carol had some friends that were childhood friends that uh, we wanted to meet. And we said, why don't we meet at the museum? And it was really interesting. The guy was like, ah, I don't care about Disney, you know, and, you know whatever. And we went in the museum and it was, it was finally at the end of the day, they're going, sir, you need to leave. You need to go home. It's Remember, Carol, how enthusiastic the, uh, he got about it? Yeah, but, but I don't, I, I mean, I think they had a good time. I don't know that they would pursue it, but. <laughs> oh, no, no, but it was just, you know, they, they were, you know, oh, Disney, that's all in the past. I've outgrown that. Oh, look. You know? so, <laughs> well, his parents were not Disney type people. They yeah. were classical yeah. music type people, so. Uh, yeah, they could watch Fantasia, so, uh, but it, it was fun, so. Uh, 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 Brent Warner has two tickets to Colonial Williamsburg. They expired in the 40s. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny how things turn up. When I, I was helping clean up my parents' house years ago, I found a ticket to the 64 World's Fair in my mom's stuff. And I said to her, why didn't you use it? And she goes, oh, I was always intending to go. And I just, you know, and, and I said, but I would have used it. And she goes, yeah, but I wanted to go one last time. I just didn't get to it. So it's, uh, you know, you wonder how many tickets or different things are still sitting out there uh, unused. So it's uh, the Colonial Williamsburg. Yeah, well, I have to go back and show up with it. It's old buildings, so you ought to be able to use old tickets, right? Yeah. Well, I appreciate folks joining. For the folks back east, I do uh, hope that you uh, do okay with your ice and snow and all the rest of it. And uh, I'm, I imagine our major rainstorm in California is passed already. We probably got a hundred drops, but uh, uh, hope all everybody's doing well. And again, do invite you next week and see you back for uh, Hemisphere 68. Talk to you later. Let's and go. Cliff, by the way, before we go, Cliff, oh, he went. Oh no, he's still there. Cliff, I've just been loving all the pictures you've been posting about your hikes and everything around. And I just keep saying, man, I got to get back to Lake, o Lake Opatcon sooner rather than later. I'm, I'm you can, you can see the map on the wall behind me. <laughs> yeah. Lake uh, You're just, welcome. And, and I love the pictures. Which of oh, your dogs okay. likes to carry the toy everywhere he goes? Yes, yes. <laughs> he's, he's at my feet right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, 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 he posts all these great pictures of him hiking, and the one dog is a pretty good sized toy he carries around. Right. You know, so uh, yeah, I just, just, I love watching those. They're great. Fantastic. Hey, Bill, one thing a lot of people were talking about the Port Authority building, the, 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 the big T. Yeah. Um, yeah. If anyone is interested in visiting, twice a year they run a wedding uh, show. Oh, and for five right. bucks, you can go in and sample their wine, sample the food, go up on the roof, take all the pictures you want, look at the views. And it's pretty much what it was when the fair was there. They don't use the round level, but for five bucks, we told them our, our son was getting married and we were scouting the place out and we were treated like royalty, but they run tw twice a year. So anyone on the East coast that wants to go through that pavilion, it's still available. If you hear that, let me know. We'll start plugging it, and people might uh, maybe have a little East Coast meetup out there. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll send you the email the next time I get one. <laughs> Sounds great. Well, thanks all. Uh, uh, hiking to oh, the Warner Brothers theme park called Jungle Habitat. Yeah, that's in Jersey, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember we went there one time, and uh, you know uh, that, that didn't last all that. It was about eight years or so it lasted. Yeah. Oh, four. Okay. I couldn't remember how, how long. Uh, you know, 
somehow a jungle habitat in Jersey sounds like the animals would not be real comfortable for much of the year. So uh, Carol and I went to one, in, was it Scotland we went to one a couple of years ago, Carol? Sorry, I think it was Scotland, yeah. Yeah. It was we an were, interesting uh, visit. <laughs> Yeah, we were driving around. We saw this thing about drive through and it, it reminded me of jungle habitat. So we went in and we got to one point where it said, you can either go left or go right. But if you go right, be aware the monkeys like to jump on your cars and rip off the antennas and uh, windshield wipers. So do it on your own risk. So I got there. I said, hell, it's a rental. So we went right. And yeah, the, the monkeys were soon jumping on cars and bounding on things. And I was thinking, oh, what if I need to use the windshield wipers after this? But we, we got out of there intact. We also got yelled at because Carol and Margo thought, oh, I'll put down the window and take a picture of these lions. And this guy in his Jeep came racing up, screaming to close the windows because the lions will come in. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the tropical jungles of Scotland, that was a great ride. Well, enjoy the hike out there. Uh, another one of these uh, urban ruins, I imagine. Great. We'll see you folks next week then. Have a great time and enjoy your week. Thanks, Bill. Oh, good job. Thank you. All right, bye. I'm